I'll talk a little bit about uh, PJ systems, um, in general, PJ ecosystems, in terms of distributions and types, uh, influence of climate, natural disturbance, land use, invasive species, and so on. And as I mentioned, I'll, I'll focus uh, a fair amount on the Uncompahgre Plateau as a case study. Uh, and I'll touch briefly in a few slides on the potential role of, of climate change on the future condition and, and health of pinyon juniper woodlands. And then I'll, I'll in a few slides, discuss uh, how restoration science then is, is, is relevant to strategies and uh, considerations for ecological restoration, I should say uh, ecological science. Same definition from Pete. Uh, I guess the only thing that I would add is that um, if we want to recover a system, one interpretation of that is that we need to understand the system. Uh, we need to understand its historic function, its composition, and its structure, uh, often referred to as its range of natural variability or historic range of variability. And I would also um, uh, like to make the case that we need to understand it in a, in a very site-specific way uh, whenever possible. Uh, there's great variability uh, over time and space uh, among PJ ecosystems. And um, if we seek to restore a system on a given piece of land, we really need to understand what happened on that particular landscape. So again, my focus is more or less on the southwest, but with uh, somewhat of a four corners focus. Uh, much of what I'm going to talk about today, I think, is relevant to Colorado Pinion and Utah Juniper Woodlands, uh, which dominate much of the Colorado Plateau, uh, but to some extent uh, is, is, is somewhat relevant, or I will talk about research that that uh, takes place in other uh, uh, pinyon juniper woodlands or, or ecosystems in the southwest in general. Uh, and the two of the more dominant are one-seeded uh, juniper and single-needle pinyon. And again, I'll focus a little bit on the Uncompahgre Plateau. Uh, this is about a 600,000 hectare landscape in western Colorado. Uh, about 250,000 hectares or so uh, are covered by pinyon juniper ecosystems. And it sits on the eastern edge of the Colorado Plateau. Um, well, a little more maybe broad background uh, than Pete provided. Um, PJ systems are widespread, um, estimated at roughly 40 million hectares. I suspect there's a few different estimates out there, uh, give or take 10 million, but certainly one of the more widespread um, uh, major vegetation types of the western U.S. They exhibit a broad range of natural variability in terms of stand structures and population dynamics. And as you might expect, they're influenced by climate, soils, competition, uh, the life history traits of the PJ species themselves, disturbance regimes, and so on. And again, somewhat like Pete, um, I'll point to the definition that was provided by Rami et al., or the classification, um, in part because for me this, I think, is a, is a very practical uh, definition. And I know Pete was a co-author on that paper, as I believe Robin was too, and maybe others here in the audience. I don't know. There's several authors on that paper. Not one of the worst I've seen. Uh, it was under 20, but... Uh, Certainly lots of PJ experts that came together and tried to compile the status of our knowledge of pinyon juniper woodlands. And not only was, it the, was this classification based to a large extent on the influence of climate, but I also thought it was practical because it, 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 um, it grouped pinyon juniper ecosystems based on structure and to some extent the driving disturbance dynamics behind those structures. So persistent woodlands, which... Um, often have uh, evidence of severe crown fire regimes, uh, savannas, which um, uh, at least logically what we would expect, and certainly there is some evidence of frequent uh, uh, low severity fire regimes, uh, and wooded shrublands, which uh, may have expanded during periods of um, uh, climate favorability and may have shrunk back during either periods of poor climate um, or possibly from lethal disturbances like fire. I want to focus a little bit on climate because it is so important to pinyon juniper woodlands and it really does account for much of the variability not only within uh, broad regions but also within single landscapes. So at a spatial scale, precipitation in particular is very important um, and determines much of the PJ species composition throughout the Intermountain West, um, uh, particularly as we move from, say, the Northwest where we have more of a winter-based or spring-based uh, precipitation load uh, relative to uh, the more southern and eastern parts of uh, Arizona and New Mexico where it's more of a monsoonal pattern with heavy summer precipitation. Uh, these types of patterns distribute uh, pinyon juniper species uh, throughout the Intermountain West um, uh, across a broad scale, but of course at fine scales, uh, 
precipitation and temperature are also very relevant. So within a given landscape, on a, on a given mountainside, uh, we may have relatively dry, open, juniper, uh, savanna-like conditions at lower elevations, uh, but as we move up in elevation and we get uh, into more mesic and, um, and cooler temperatures, um, we may transition to fairly pinion-dominated uh, dense woodlands. And of course, climate is variable over, over time as well. And on short-term scales, um, climate can determine things like the timing and rate of regeneration of PJ uh, uh, species in, in woodlands. Uh, it can uh, certainly contribute to uh, uh, disturbance, such as drought may end up quickly thinning a stand, for instance, as a result of drought dieback. Um, and as a result of disturbance in regeneration patterns, can result in a fairly quick uh, process of shifting mosaics and even ecotones. Uh, Long-term trends are also important, and as, again, Pete alluded to, um, we know that uh, there have been various Holocene-based uh, range expansions due to various favorable uh, climatic periods. Uh, Pete talked a little bit about the Great Basin. Utah Juniper provides another good example. Uh, during the mid-Holocene, for instance, during a warmer and drier period, uh, Utah Juniper was able to uh, migrate northward um, from Colorado and... Um, uh, Utah into Wyoming, so it moved uh, substantially northward uh, under favorable conditions. Now I want to focus a little bit on natural disturbance. Uh, climate itself can be a form of natural disturbance. Drought conditions are very important in PJ systems. But the response certainly can vary, not only by pinion juniper ecosystem type, but, but between the species themselves. This is probably somewhat of an oversimplification, but McDowell et al. I think does a nice job of laying out the, uh, my, my representation of McDowell et al.'s work, I should say, not their work. They do a nice job of laying out the differences uh, between um, pinions and junipers in terms of their response to drought. And um, in a nutshell, uh, they uh, present the case that pinions are generally less tolerant, that they may be more prone to carbon starvation, especially under prolonged drought. And junipers um, uh, may be thought of as generally more drought tolerant, but actually can be prone to um, uh, hydraulic failures uh, under uh, periods of intense drought. And again, I'm sure that's an over, uh, uh, sort of an uh, overgeneralization, and there may be ecophysiologists among us here that uh, would have a more nuanced take on it, but I think that that's a, perhaps a fair generalization uh, in terms of the types of responses that we see from PJ today, especially in response to drought. Um, in addition to drought, insects and other pathogens uh, um, and diseases play a big role in PJ disturbance ecology. Um, although there are nu numerous biological mortality agents, um, uh, needle scale, black stain root disease, uh, um, and so on, uh, sorry, black stain root fungus and so on, um, pinion ips beetles, a bark beetle that uh, attacks pinions, have certainly played a major role in recent years throughout the Southwest. Um, you can see from this map here, hopefully, hopefully you can read this, pinion damage uh, is indicated in red and the full range of pinion juniper woodlands in green. Uh, this map was made in 2005, I believe, right after sort of the end of this epidemic. This was 2002 to 2004 was the time period of the outbreak. Um, and um, uh, it caused extensive mortality. In fact, I think the most recent estimate I saw was somewhere around 1.2 million hectares throughout the uh, southwestern U.S., throughout these four corner states. Uh, and mortality was extensive as well in many stands, upwards of 90% or nearly 100% pinion mortality um, in many um, of these uh, southwestern stands that were heavily affected. However, it's worth noting that the combined effects of drought and, and bark beetle did not have an equal effect, of course, among the two species. Uh, juniper generally favored or fared quite well um, with most juniper, um, uh, uh, most stands with juniper. Um, exhibiting less than 10% mortality of juniper trees. Uh, and it's also worth pointing out, too, in the study that I cite there by Floyd et al., which was just published a few years back, um, that when they studied different PJ systems in different parts of the Four Corners, um, they did not find a, a density relationship between the rate of mortality um, and the rate of pinion dieback uh, and um, uh, uh, stand density. Fire is, uh, I think, a challenging um, uh, aspect of disturbance ecology for uh, pinion juniper woodlands, in part because it's a, it's a disturbance agent that we want to control. We feel we have more potential control over fire than, say, something like beetles in, in many ways. And yet we still really don't have, I think, a good understanding of fire. Um, 
in 2004, I published with my advisor, Bill Baker, a, a systematic literature review um, on our status of our knowledge about fire and its role in pinyon juniper uh, ecosystems. A lot of this information has been updated uh, to some extent in the Rami et al. paper that was cited earlier and uh, some of the recent work um, that, that Pete mentioned, especially in terms of fire scars. Um, Pete mentioned a few studies where we've uh, been able to date successfully fire scars uh, within uh, opinions in particular. Um, but one of the things that I think still does stand is that there's often not much evidence uh, for, for um, low severity fires in, in many PJ uh, ecosystems. Um, and that's in part because the pinion juniper species generally don't scar or don't scar very well. Uh, now it may depend on which systems you're in and what part of the range you're in. Much of the evidence we have for uh, fire scars or fire um, regimes in pinion junipers in the southwest, for instance, come from uh, dating of, of trees that burned that were adjacent to pinion juniper systems like ponderosa pine, which scar fairly well and record uh, fire scars well and allow us to make inferences about the fire behavior in adjacent pinion juniper woodlands or savannas. High severity fires, I think there's maybe, a, a, at least at the time of this paper, was a little more evidence, uh, direct evidence of the role of high severity fires, especially in persistent woodlands. Um, and um, since then, uh, additional research has come out um, that um, has studied either those systems or others and generally points to a fairly long rotation fire regime. So although these are fairly um, persistent, uh, closed, older stands that tend to be affected by high, high severity fires, um, the average return interval is quite lengthy, usually 400 years or longer. Of course, there's a lot of anthropogenic or land use influences that are really relevant to pinion juniper restoration. Of course, I think that's why we're all here. We know that our impacts on these systems have changed them, and we know that there may be things that we can do to, um, to restore them, and that includes uh, uh, fire exclusion, livestock raising, non-native species, uh, clearing, cutting, as Pete especially pointed out in his talk, and uh, potentially uh, the harbingers of global climate change in this last decade, and, and certainly there are projections of, of what climate change may do within the southwest and how it might affect pinion juniper woodlands in particular. But some of the concerns, of course, are the increased stand density, the PJ invasion into adjacent shrublands, reduced biodiversity, enhanced erosion, altered hy hydrologic and disturbance regimes, and so on. This is a picture, I think this is by Robin as well. Nope, it's okay, I snagged them. It's a .org, I figured it was okay if I snagged these photos. And it's a great shot because it does show one of the tools we have to, um, to document changes in PJ density, uh, especially in terms of expansion and infilling. And that is photographic uh, uh, history uh, in terms of photo comparisons between older and, and newer photos. Um, the other tool, of course, is dendrochronology where we take tree cores and we can date trees and just determine how old they are. Um, but there's no doubt that throughout the Intermountain West, there are um, plenty of examples of infilling and invasion. Um, but I also think it's worth noting there's places where that hasn't happened. In fact, the Uncompahgre Plateau stands out as one of those examples where there's been very little evidence uh, through a couple of different studies um, that, have take, that have been uh, carried out on, on that landscape. Uh, there's been very little evidence of expansion uh, over, the, over the past uh, several decades. Um, certainly, again, fire suppression may play a role. Uh, when we have evidence of fire especially, uh, we can point to fire suppression as maybe being a culprit. Um, but there are many other cases for expansion and infilling, and Pete did a great job of focusing on this on his talk. So, I, and I, in fact, don't spend a lot of time on this in mind, but certainly the effects of livestock grazing that might reduce the uh, competition um, on uh, tree seedlings by um, forbs and grasses and, and shrubs, uh, climate variability, uh, natural expansion, reestablishment from past disturbances, and so on. Livestock grazing, too, is a potential detrimental uh, has a potential detrimental effect in PJ systems. Um, of course, it depends greatly on the intensity, the seasonality, and so on, but um, certainly we know that in some cases, livestock grazing may contribute to greater uh, tree seedling survival or density, uh, could contribute to woodland expansion, uh, can lead to changes in plant community composition, and um, uh, can reduce biological soil crust cover, which is very important in the southwest in particular as a source of uh, uh, a structure that holds soil resources together, provides nutrients, and so on. Invasive species are another threat in PJ systems. 
Um, why is it that we, we have a fire like this, which burned in 1996, if I remember? I took that picture in 2003. Um, and then we have another fire a year later that burned in um, 1997, took the picture the same year. And we have completely different outcome in terms of uh, cheatgrass invasion. One, the former photo, I found one cheatgrass in that entire stand after sampling it. This one, I found uh, two or three or more, uh, quite a few. Um, we did do a study on this, and I won't present it today, but certainly cheatgrass, uh, I won't present the results today, but cheatgrass is a concern because um, it does so well in these post-fire environments, potentially. Uh, it's partly climate-driven and partly environmental, uh, partly land-use driven, perhaps. Um, but when it becomes established, especially in post-fire environments, it can easily outcompete native species. Uh, and once it does so, uh, it can alter fire regimes um, by drying uh, early in the growing season, creating a continuous uh, horizontal fuel load that then burns much more frequently and, uh, poten and potentially uh, prohibits the uh, reestablishment of native uh, species, especially long-lived species like trees and shrubs. Okay, so I'm going to focus, hopefully I have enough time here to get through this, but focus a little bit on the Uncompagre Plateau. Again, this is in western Colorado, right on the edge of the uh, Colorado Plateau. And you can see from this picture, um, in this one landscape, the great tremendous diversity um, within these pinyon juniper uh, ecosystems. Again, underscoring my point earlier that we need to think site-specific when we think about restoration. We wouldn't necessarily apply the restoration strategy here uh, to a system uh, here because they're, they're different. The soils are different. The stand structures are different. The disturbance dynamics may have been different. And we can see this to some extent in these uh, age structure graphs. We um, uh, cored uh, roughly 60 stands in 2003 and dated them. And um, I'm just going to anecdotally present a few different stands to just show you some of the structural diversity that we have within this landscape. Here's a stand that uh, was uh, essentially an older juniper stand that saw an invasion of pinion sometime, I'd use that word somewhat loosely, but uh, an, an influx of pinion uh, sometime during the late 1800s, uh, but otherwise didn't appear to have any pinion in the record whatsoever. Uh, another stand, even older in terms of the juniper component, uh, the oldest cohort is right around the year 1600. And in this case, our pinion influx came in um, much earlier, about 100 years earlier, but again, had a fairly continuous uh, and fairly dense uh, um, cohort uh, structure uh, once it did arrive. This one, I think, is yet another contrast um, where we have a very old juniper stand dating back to the 1300s. Um, and not unlike other stands, we have often older pinions that are scattered throughout the record, but again, a fairly uh, dramatic increase of pinions, in this case, again, right around this date, which happens to coincide with Euro-American um, settlement in that area, right around 1880. These are very old stands in general. In other words, the oldest trees uh, were typically well over 300 years old. Uh, in fact, the, the majority of the trees uh, typically were, were quite old, uh, not just the oldest trees. Um, and some of our stands were uh, 600 years old or older. In fact, in many stands, the oldest trees were, were basically undateable because of the quality of the wood. Um, roughly 10% of the stands were of pre um, or post-Euro-American settlement origin. Um, most of those were either mechanically cleared, um, of post-disturbance recovery, uh, and a few may have been uh, examples of recent invasion into non-woodland systems. Now, when we look at the compositate structure, and I'm, I'm not sure how well I pointed this out last time, but the bottom graph here is the pinion, of course, and the juniper uh, is up top, and this is all the stands compiled together. Um, we can see an interesting pattern. Again, we see this sharp increase, somewhat reminiscent of what we saw in some of those individual stands, but here, when we compile all the stands, that increase began in the late 1700s, uh, which was about 100 years before Euro-American settlement. Um, junipers, on the other hand, uh, maintain this pretty remarkable consistency in their density uh, among age classes. Um, these trees per hectare over here, again, I apologize if I didn't uh, explain the uh, axes very well, and the age class bins here. Um, but there's this remarkable uh, consistency and density among the age classes in junipers. And, uh, to some extent, at least graphically, they correspond with periods of drought as indicated by the Palmer Drought Severity Index on the graph above. And junipers really somewhat, uh, excuse me, pinions exhibit almost the inverse relationship with these peaks during relatively moist periods. And that's not unlike what's been found in other PJ systems. And when we uh, use more precisely dated um, younger trees from the 20th century, 
we were able to come up with uh, statistically significant uh, relationships between climate drivers and rates of establishment. And um, junipers um, did not fare as well during relatively uh, above average uh, periods of moisture. And pinions uh, actually did uh, have much uh, higher rates of, of regeneration during these periods of above average moisture. Oop, go the right way. So, okay, in summary, what, so what does this mean to restoration? If we were going to use this information, what might be relevant? Well, I think it's important to, to note that um, after this sort of extended dry period when we didn't really have much in a way of extended uh, high moisture periods, um, we saw a release or a response of the pinion uh, population that probably benefited um, from additional um, above average moisture periods in the 1800s and 1900s, um, as well as the effects of, a, of a settlement uh, in the late 1880s. And, and in terms of the climate variability, though, I think that points to the, um, the traits of pinion, including their, its relative drought intolerance, its vulnerability to disturbance, and its episodic regeneration strategy. It's a species that produces a synchronized cone crop, uh, often after periods of, of relatively um, good growing conditions. Uh, junipers, on the other hand, have a fairly steady population structure, um, uh, in part probably because of their relative drought tolerance, their slower reproductive rates, and because they're generally longer lived. Natural disturbance definitely played a role on this landscape. We found a fairly ample evidence of charcoal and, and snags, and using that evidence and um, stand ages, we estimated a fire rotation of around 400 to 600 years on the plateau. And we also documented insect and disease at generally lower uh, background, sort of chronic disturbance type rates. Uh, but shortly after we sampled that uh, uh, landscape, of course, the, the dieback occurred. And we, we didn't have data for that, but it certainly affected the Uncompahgre Plateau, especially in certain areas. And again, we know that recent land use and non-native species have played a role. Livestock grazing, again, correlated somewhat with the increase of pinions. Um, we also did a little side study where we looked at pinion densities, or excuse me, yeah, pinion seedling densities between grazed and ungrazed landscapes and found an almost threefold increase on the grazed, um, heavily grazed landscapes. Um, although I don't go into the details here, we looked at the drivers of post-fire cheatgrass invasion and um, um, uh, various factors that may be leading to the degradation of the native, un, uh, native plant understory. Um, and that's relevant in, only in the sense that that's part of our restoration focus too. If, if ecological restoration is of interest and we are concerned with diversity, then we need to understand the understory community as well as the overstory structure. Um, but I'd argue that fire exclusion had little, if any, effect on this uh, landscape. We found uh, no fire scars in our case in uh, around four years of, of researching the Uncompahgre Plateau um, and um, little evidence of, of, of a low severity fire regime um, in terms of the sort of structural conditions also, the fuel conditions that would support um, a low severity fire regime on this landscape. Okay, quickly, I think I'll have enough time to, to talk about climate change. Um, it's important to, to know that, in, in, and many of you do, I'm sure, that the Southwest is a, period, a place in the United States that has experienced um, extreme droughts in the past, uh, or mega droughts. In fact, these droughts have been much more severe and much more prolonged than the most recent drought that we experienced in the early 2000s and the late 1990s. Um, and when we look at projections and we look at scientists that use uh, global uh, circulation models to make projections about the Southwest, um, they basically predict a much drier and hotter uh, southwestern U.S. Um, and that have led, that's led some to, to sort of speculate about the future of the Southwest, uh, not only in terms of the ecosystems that it supports, but the people too. Are we looking at a future where we're going to have not only a hotter and, and drier climate, but also one that continues to have major mega droughts? And if we do, might we see uh, rapid change and extensive dieback, uh, as we witnessed in uh, uh, pinion woodlands in particular in the Southwest in the early 2000s? And could that push those systems and those landscapes beyond ecological thresholds? And it certainly seems plausible if this is our future. This is a picture that Craig Allen took uh, from the USGS in uh, near Los Alamos, um, showing the uh, dieback uh, shortly after it occurred in 2002, um, which was a, a, a drought and beetle-induced uh, dieback or mortality event. And then again, almost two years later, showing the needle fall. And you can't help but be struck by the rapid transformation here um, uh, between these two time periods. 
um, the structural, the species, uh, the compositional, the functional changes that are, that are occurring on that landscape. Um, and the question is, is, is that part of the future for southwestern pinyon juniper woodlands? Okay, I'm going to leave that thought there and just quickly talk about restoration. I, I brought up my other research on understory communities because um, I, I like to point out that restoration has, I think, two basic forms, a more passive form and a more active form. Uh, passive restoration can be used, for instance, to restore understory communities that might be suffering from, um, say, overgrazing. Um, and instead of having to uh, take heavy-handed approaches, we might be able to reduce or eliminate grazing to restore understory communities. Uh, active restoration, on the other hand, requires um, structural or other major changes to the system um, uh, that require more of a hands-on approach and uh, might include things like mechanical thinning and biomass harvest. Uh, and certainly, when we have good evidence that those stands um, would require that sort of uh, restoration approach, then that might be the appropriate um, technique to use. And biomass harvest might be a, a beneficial outcome. And I just want to add that, that I think it's important that science uh, play a key role here and work with land managers to continue to research and monitor uh, these, these types of uh, uh, restoration activities to make sure that um, we understand and we document the, uh, uh, the effects and that we work toward a, a more uh, efficient and um, successful restoration uh, programs in the future. And then lastly, I just want to hit on a few points that, that I think science, again, can help uh, play a major role in restoration, uh, whether it be for biomass harvest purposes or otherwise, or whether biomass harvest be part of the outcome of restoration or otherwise. And the first is that, again, I think it's important to understand site-specific historical ranges of variability, to document contemporary conditions, and then identify the key reasons or the key drivers between those differences. If we know there's a difference, but we don't understand what's driving the difference, and we restore those systems, we might miss the boat. If we think it's fire that's missing from a system, and we introduce fire, but what was really driving the changes was, was cattle grazing or livestock grazing, then we may find ourselves needing to restore those systems yet again in the near future. So, of course, it's an obvious and maybe silly example, but it, it underscores the point that we really need to make sure that we understand the key drivers. Um, because of the very dramatic recent changes that we've seen, um, I think it's important to make sure that we're assessing recent trends, especially recent trends that point toward um, very dramatic, very um, rapid or threshold-like responses from ecosystems. And I think increasingly that means we need to look at interactions between climate change land use and invasive species, and their interactions with natural disturbance agents uh, like uh, uh, pinion ips beetles or other uh, uh, mortality agents. I think it's important to use science to assess the vulnerability of these environments um, to specific restoration activities. Before we um, embark on a restoration plan, of course, we need to consider the potential damage to soils, uh, to not, uh, the potential to introduce non-native species, uh, or to en enhance um, uh, uh, disturbance interactions that would be undesirable. And then lastly, I think because we're stuck in this middle ground now of, of wanting to restore the past, but recognizing that we're potentially on a, a rapid transformation toward the future because of land use and global climate change, um, science, I think, can help us to strike a balance between using the past as, as a guide for restoration uh, under the premise that we'll have more sustainable systems but think ahead about um, likely future changes, um, uh, especially under climate change, uh, so that we can um, work toward more resilient and more resistant uh, uh, ecosystems in the future that might not be prone to the sort of um, catastrophic uh, detrimental effects that we see now in the Southwest, for instance, in many places, uh, as a result of interactions between fire and, and, and non-natives and, and uh, uh, other disturbance agents. And with that, I'll, I'll quit. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Mm -hmm.